Hey guys, welcome back to RPO Restoration. So starting today, we're going to start breaking down some of these component systems that you have in your 80s or 90s GM car or truck. And we're going to start with something that's pretty universal across all the engine lines, and that is the GM high energy ignition system. So if you want to spend a couple minutes and learn a little bit more about the basics of your system, then stay tuned. We'll jump right in and get started. So for those of you that don't know, the GM HEI system was introduced in 1975 on all General Motors passenger cars and light trucks. The other uh, car makers, Ford, Chrysler, Dodge, Lincoln, Mercury, uh, all introduced high energy ignition systems around the same time. Um, this is one of those few things that kind of came out of the emissions era um, that actually made sense. Uh, a lot of the car makers did this because they figure if they could get a better burn within the cylinder and the combustion chamber, they could reduce emissions. But this had the side effect of creating a hotter and better spark. Cars ran better. Uh, they required less maintenance because you eliminated the points of condenser system. And uh, this system generally worked very well under most conditions. Uh, and allowed the cars to actually run better, start better, and things like that. So I think GM actually hit a home run with this one, so much so to the point that uh, the other car manufacturers actually started to copy their design after a few years. That shows you how good it is. So uh, let's take a look. We're going to take a look at the system. I'm going to show you the main components next, and then at the end of the video, I'm going to show you couple of things you need to check uh, real quick if you have a system that you know hasn't been touched in a while or you want to learn a little bit more about it and make sure it's running properly. Okay, so here we have our distributor, the main part of the GM high energy ignition system. There are four types of systems um, and you determine that by looking at your control module, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but just to give you a breakdown of the three different types that exist, there is a four pin system, that's the original HEI system that was introduced in 1975. That also contains a vacuum advance, which you would see over around this side of the distributor cap. And that also would contain advanced weights located underneath the rotor inside. Most of those were phased out by the late 70s and they were replaced by the five pin system. Now that system consisted of a vacuum advance and weights just like the older system, but it also incorporated a knock sensor. There was a crude uh, system to retard the timing when the engine knocked, uh, I think if you got three knocks within five seconds, it would retard the timing a few degrees for about 30 seconds and then start the cycle all over again. Uh, if your motor continued to knock, it would just continue to retard the timing and the cycle would repeat itself. And the later iterations of this system are the seven pin system. Um, that eliminated the vacuum advance and weights. It kept the knock sensor, uh, but this time the knock sensor was connected to the engine computer in the GM computer command control system. And all timing, uh, retardation and advance was handled by the engine computer. Uh, every distributor setup has a connector uh, located usually in the bottom left hand side with the number of pins. So if you have four connectors, you have a four pin system, five pin, five connectors, five pins, seven pin, and so forth. Um, these pin connectors will uh, eventually wind up going to the module uh, underneath, which I will show you in a few seconds. So now let's break down some of the main components of the system. It's very simple, uh, but it consists of five main components or areas. One is the main assembly, uh, which contains the pin connector, the shaft, the capacitor, as well as the magnetic poles, which actually determine where the engine is at in its cycle. 
The next component would consist of the distributor cap that many of you are familiar with. Underneath the distributor cap, you'll find a large rotor, which contacts the contacts inside the cap to actually send the electricity down the spark plug wire to the spark plug. On top of the cap, because these are a coiling cap system, you'll find a cover underneath that cover, which is held on by two small bolts or screws. You will find the actual ignition coil, which increases the electrical energy coming through your car's electrical system up to that necessary 25, 35,000 volts to fire your spark plug. And the last component of this system is the actual ignition wires, which send the energy down to your spark plug and the spark plugs themselves. That's it. It's a very simple system uh, and problems are fairly easy to diagnose because of that. So now let's move on to some things that you should be looking for uh, when you buy a car or you're restoring a car that has one of these systems. Okay, most of these checks are pretty easy. They're just some basic visual checks uh, around the ignition setup of the car to determine how old things are and whether anything is visibly wrong. So the first thing you want to check is your plugs and wires. Uh, first thing I would do is look at the wires themselves, see if you can determine how old they are, do they look beat up, do they look melted, has anything come in contact with them, are they nicked? The energy flowing through this system is so high that any nicks or melts in the actual ignition wires are gonna make the electricity jump to a ground, sometimes it'll jump out of the wire into the engine block and you'll wind up with a dead cylinder. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your wires are in good shape and fairly new. If wires have seen a lot of miles, I've also, from personal experience, had the contacts within, within them after so many, you know, hundreds of thousands of heat cycles actually start to uh, separate and you wind up uh, stalling out when your engine gets too hot and then you have to let everything cool down and it'll start and run like normal till it gets too hot again. So first thing you want to do is check your wiring, make sure that's good. After that, you want to start pulling your spark plugs. Um, normally you pull all eight. Uh, that's what I like to do just to get a determination of how each cylinder is running. You can find uh, pictures online or they they probably still are in the back of every Haynes manual uh, that shows you spark plug, plug colors, what, your, what a healthy uh, cylinder should look like, what one that's running too hot, too lean, oil contamination, mechanical damage, things like that. So you want to take a look at your spark plugs. They should be a nice uh, light brown or have a nice light brown haze or coating over them. Hey, while you have your plugs out too, it might be a good time to make sure that they are actually the correct plug for your motor. Uh, a lot of 80s era V8 engines used uh, spark plug in combination with what GM called a gasket, what most of us would call a washer, to make sure there was a good seal. Uh, a lot of V6 engines used taper gaskets, which did not require any type of washer. So just double check, make sure that somewhere along the line, somebody didn't mix them up and you have the wrong plug type for your motor in there. So now that we know our plugs and wires are good, it's time to take a look under the cap and see what's going on under there. Uh, all this requires is a big Phillips head screwdriver or a flathead, whatever you need to get in there. There are four screws on the side that are held uh, tight by spring tension. So all you have to do is push down and rotate the screws 180 degrees out to take your cap off. Don't worry about lining it back up. Everything's notched. You can only put it back uh, in one position. So don't be afraid. You're not going to mess anything up by taking a look underneath. Now that we've got our cap off, we're going to flip it back and take a look inside. Now, admittedly, this cap has about 10,000 or so miles on it. It's a couple years old. Uh, it's probably going to get changed. 
maybe next spring after a few more thousand miles. But generally, you should be changing these things after 12,000 miles, every four oil changes, however you want to keep track of it, because they are a wear item. These are a regular part of the tune-up, and they need to be changed out. The cap and the rotor back here. But let's start by focusing on the cap. You see our carbon button's in good shape. This is the actual piece that spin, that the rotor contacts as it spins around and sends the electrical energy through uh, the coil inside the cap and then passes through this button into the center part of that rotor where it is then fed out uh, to that tab on the end and it contacts one of the contacts for each cylinder. Uh, when you look at this, you're looking for any kind of abnormal wear. Any cap that's been used is going to have some wear in it, but you're looking for anything crazy. All our tabs are in pretty good shape. Uh, they're starting to corrode a little bit, and that's just a natural part of electricity passing through them so many times. But you want to look for anything that appears abnormal or out of the way. Another thing you want to look at or look for in here is what's called carbon tracking. Uh, if you see, looks like somebody took a pencil and drew uh, lines running along the inside of the cap. That is a byproduct of electricity not going where it's supposed to be. It jumps out of the circuit and it goes somewhere it's not supposed to and it leaves those carbon tracks behind almost like a little lightning bolt. So if you see some of them, it's time to change out your cap. <clears throat> Next, we'll move over here to the rotor, and you can get a good view of that. A little bit of carbon in the middle, but nothing crazy. A little bit of wear on the uh, tab on the edge, but nothing out of the ordinary. No cracks, no carbon tracking along that. So I think uh, this rotor is still in pretty good serviceable shape. Below the rotor here, you can actually see the... Ignition module. This is the transistorized system that actually controls your high energy ignition system. These either work or they don't. Um, and the only way to really figure out uh, if it's working or not is kind of to rule everything else out. And if you're still having ignition problems, it's probably your control module. Uh, when you install these, and they're just held in place by these two bolts, Make sure you get a good heat sink paste off Amazon. Don't just use dielectric grease. You need something that's going to help transfer the heat from the actual module itself, from the electricity passing through it, down to the actual main body of your distributor system. Uh, you can't use dielectric grease. It just doesn't work as well. Use a good heat sink paste. You can pick up for like five, eight bucks off Amazon. All right, now that we've got our cap back on, uh, we're going to wrap this video up. Please let me know in the comments section if you'd like to see a part two of this video where I run through some common problems and fixes with these systems. Uh, just, so just let me know. I would appreciate that. Also, if you like 80s and 90s cars and trucks, make sure you hit that subscribe button because we've got a whole lot more content coming. Guys, I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you on the next one.